Keys to the Kingdom. Siloam and Kingdom friends, welcome back to our Keys to the Kingdom podcast in anticipation, preparation and celebration of the Keys to the Kingdom conference 2024, 24 to 27 October. We are ready, our speakers are ready and we want you to get ready with us. We are unpacking this great journey day by day and we know the Lord is blessing us with all the content that we are creating right here. So like, subscribe, follow and share all of this to family and friends for them to be a part of what the Lord is doing across all of Siloam. Today we are joined by Pastor Reynold Manicum, our lead pastor from Siloam Word of Truth in Santon. Welcome Pastor Reynold. Thank you, Pastor Adrian. Good to be here with you and with everybody who's going to be watching us. Awesome, awesome. You guys just celebrated seven years anniversary yes. in Santon. So what's the Lord doing in Santon? What's the Lord doing? Well, it's been seven years of fun. I always <laughs> say that. Uh, ministry has been fun. And I, true that, I, I, I mean that in the true sense of the word. It really has just been a blessing of the Lord. Uh, this year has been a year of rest, but mm. I... Um, often say I did not know that resting in the Lord could be so busy yeah. because there's just been a lot of activity uh, going on, uh, just new people coming in and the Lord growing His church. And we look forward next year just to experiencing more of His grace. Awesome, awesome. And I think I speak for all of Siloam when we congratulate you and the church on the seven years. Thank you, so, sir. Pastor Reynolds, what we are discussing is from Matthew chapter 16, 18 to 19. And it says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. My question to everybody that sit in that hot seat right there is this, yeah. <laughs> what is your exegesis of the text? Well, thank you for the question. It is indeed a hot seat. Um, <laughs> I think just looking at, at the scripture in um, the full context, uh, for me, it's just relationship that really stands out yeah. a lot. And um, the relationship I think that's presented to us is the relationship of the individual to Christ. Yeah. And so it's finding the foundation of our relationship with him. You know, the questions is always just such an interesting thing to observe in the scripture. Yeah. And here, the, the great question is, who do you say yeah. that I am? Jesus is very intentional. Yes. Um, and he's asking for a response from the disciples, and it is an individual who gives that response. You know, who do you say that I am? And there has to be a conviction. There has to be what we understand from the text, a revelation in our personal relationship with Christ. Yeah. We can't just be doing this walk with Jesus Christ um, on the basis of, well, somebody else has done it and we're just trying yeah. to copycat them or, you know, whether it's our parents or friends or whatever the case may be. We need to understand the yeah. foundation of our relationship with Jesus. Who do you say that I am? What is the basis of your belief in me? Yeah. You know, and, and what's the revelation that you have of me? And so it's that relationship between the individual or the disciple, the follower of Christ and Christ himself. But there's also a very special relationship here in this text of the church. Yeah. Because then Jesus goes on to say, on this rock, I will build my church. And it is the only place in the Gospels that we find this word for church, for church that is used, yes. the Ecclesia, the called out ones. And so we find those who believe in him, who have this revelation of him, um, obviously then are the called out group that is the church. But Jesus also takes possession of his church. You yeah. know, this is my church. I will build my church. And so I find um, just looking at the text there's so much to do with relationship, a very powerful relationship, but a relationship between Jesus and the individual, a relationship between Jesus and his, his church. church. Yeah, because if you look at the context of it, the disciples grew up within the Jewish uh, understanding and yeah. religious understanding of the day, the traditions of the day. They may have been fishermen, they may have been text collectors, yep. doctors, whatever it may have been at that moment in time. So to them, this is a foreign concept. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. This concept of church is a oh, foreign yes. concept. Absolutely. Um, and in the day, it's a revolutionary concept. Yes, it is. So as I'm, I'm hearing you say, it's our personal relationship with Christ, but then also the corporate relationship that yep. he has yeah. uh, with his church. So in your, in your estimation then, when we speak of it as a revolutionary concept, um, you're saying it's Christ to the church. So how does the church now stand in relationship to him when it comes to the keys to the kingdom? So, again, it's based on the personal relationship, the conviction, right? That yeah. revelation that we have. Uh, but to your question, let's, let's lock in on that word keys. Yes. Um, what we find in the scriptures, I, I believe Jesus is letting us know that there is a certain authority. Come on. You know, he's talking about keys and then there's the language of the binding and the loosing. And when you, when you take a key, you use it to lock and to unlock, you know. So it's that. It's giving something the freedom to be yeah. or restricting it from having that life force or energy, that yeah. freedom. Um, so he's saying then that once we have this personal belief, then we have the, the ecclesia, the church, then we, we, uh, we belong to him. And it is in that identity. Yep. That relationship gives us an identity. Now we live in a position of authority based on this identity we have in Christ. It's great that you say, you know, it's revolutionary. And, and they have this framework of a Jewish culture. But just as you said, the church is a new concept. A new concept. Well, he's introducing them to this concept. And he's saying, what is greatly different is that I'm not calling you to a position of authority. Yep. Which is, you know, the Genesis story. I'm placing you here on the earth. And I'm giving you a level of authority to lead, to rule, and to reign here in yes. the earth. And now he's giving them that back uh, in a different sort of context where there's a lot more spiritual deputization, if you will, yeah. um, which is needed and is relevant for that day and age and this day and age. Very different from when it was in the garden. Nevertheless, an authority that is coming over them. Mm. So the key is speaking to a level of authority that we have because it means we have something in our hand. Yes. It means we can now shut something off or we can open it up yeah. and give it liberty yeah. and freedom. Yeah, because again, it's, it's, it's in my estimation, him sharing his authority with us. Absolutely. Um, and the beauty of our relationship with Christ is that he does share himself. So not only as what you were saying in Genesis in terms of the authority and the dominion, but also the character, the traits, the personality of who God is. Oh, amen. So yeah. for us to operate then at a level of effectiveness and success as the king, as the church and the kingdom, we must recognize that he shares himself with us. Absolutely. And then he shares that authority with us. Oh, absolutely. So... In your leadership as a pastor and as a lead pastor of your church and your campus, what do you believe then as keys to the kingdom, your role as spiritual leader is to advance and to speak into the life of the church and the kingdom? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Such a good question. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think, let's generalize it, if you don't mind, yeah. just the subject of leadership, you know, because... Uh, yes, there is my role as a spiritual leader, but that, that's the grace of God over my life. There's another person that's um, standing in a position of leadership, whether it is business sector yeah. or education sector, or whatever it is, there is leadership. I mean, there's the husband to his wife and yes. the father to his children. And I think understanding that we have keys to the kingdom, um, it places on us a level of responsibility. It must cause us to sit back and to think, what is the responsibility of the leadership role that I have? Yeah, yeah. You know, as a pastor, I have a voice, for example, whenever I stand behind the pulpit yeah. and I have word to share. But what is the actual impact on the people? You know, um, and as a husband, I have covering over my wife. What is the responsibility that comes with that? And beyond just the task at hand, you know, we, we can define uh, or give a job description to the various roles. Yes. But I believe a great part of this relationship with Christ and living out the keys to the kingdom, a great part of that is lifestyle. Sure. It comes through lifestyle. It is not about what I am just able to do in the moment as the stereotypical expectation. Yeah. Well, I'm a pastor, I'm expected to know how to pray. Yeah. I'm a pastor, I'm expected to know how to share the scripture. You know, um, Yes, but beyond that, there is a greater responsibility that's calling me to a lifestyle. lifestyle. It's what I do 
when others are observing and when others are not observing. And if, if I can maybe clarify it this way, God gives us this authority and he calls us to a certain relationship and we can maybe look at Daniel as an example. Yeah. Daniel had a lifestyle of prayer. prayer. He did not just know how to pray, you know, just because it was a certain occasion. It was a lifestyle of prayer. Well, living that lifestyle of prayer positioned him in the authority that Christ intended for his yeah. life because then a king changes his mind and his lifestyle yeah. and the decree from the from the king changes you know an entire nation and so it's that it's what will we do in the bedchamber yes with our responsibility and the life that god calls us to not just the task that is at hand so it's it's the lifestyle it's the how can i put it it's the actual performance of my duties in terms of my responsibility that i understand that people you know might not even hear much what i say but it's how i live this thing. absolutely how we live because if if you hear it i mean you know there's many ways that we can define a powerful preacher for example yeah. but you know how much of that is true one has the style of teaching the other has the style of preaching another one may be loud another one may be quieter um and we know that you can be de effective even if you have different leadership styles. Yeah. What is it that matters then? It's the relationship with the Lord. Um, it, 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 this is the case, is that as an individual, you have this relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And the lifestyle that you live, you know, it, it's the context is of I bind and I loose. I have keys that I may lock, I may unlock. Well, what is it that causes that binding and that loosing? Yeah. It is what I permit in the atmosphere. Mm. And beyond the things that I say, beyond the things that people see, my lifestyle is what permits something in the atmosphere. What does the angel say to Daniel when, you know, Daniel is fasting and seeking yeah. God? He says, Daniel, uh, your prayer was heard on the first day, but there was an interruption in the heavenlies and the prince of Persia had to be fought. Yeah. And we understand that that is in the angelic realm. Yeah. Uh, but he gives a title, the prince of Persia. There is an earthly understanding of the prince of Persia. And what we need to understand as believers there is that there's a correlation. The lifestyle that the leader of the land lives allows or restricts what happens in the spiritual, spiritual. atmosphere. Wow. All right. If that makes sense. I hope yeah. that makes sense. So the way that we're living therein is the binding and the loosing. Am I living in sin? I'm permitting something in something. the spiritual atmosphere. Yes. Yes. Am I being devoted in my marriage? I'm permitting, permitting. and yes. restricting at the same time no. something in the spiritual atmosphere. And that's what we see there. The Prince of Persia, you know, it is, is not an angel, yeah. but there's a correlation. There's something happening in the heavenlies with the leadership structure uh, in, the, in the earthly realm that is allowing mm -hmm. for the heavenly influence. So with that being said, again, referencing Daniel... Um, you spoke firstly of his lifestyle of yeah. prayer. Then you spoke now again about how the, the spiritual is impacted by it. So my one question of to you will then be this. When Daniel lived the lifestyle of prayer, yeah. his lifestyle of prayer offended others. <laughs> you yes, know, which did. means then that the demonic forces, the prince of Persia, um, it, which means that the attack of the enemy was upon him. So mm. people betrayed him. People accused him. People yeah. had all of these various things that they threw against him because of this lifestyle. So when Christ says that the gates of hell, yeah. the gates of Hades will not prevail against us, in your estimation, in your encouragement to our people today, what does that mean when we live that lifestyle that you are speaking of? Um, a few things. Firstly, let's pick up on the word offensive. Yes. The believer must live an offensive life. <laughs> must. Um, especially, you know, if we speak in our current day generation, yeah. um, a lot of things want us cancelled. <laughs> yes, true. true. <laughs> right? Um, but we need to rise up and we need to be offensive in the sense that it is not our duty to be culturally relevant. Yeah. It is our duty to uphold the scripture. And righteousness, yes. You know, and, and, and the scripture is not there to make people feel comfortable. Yeah. It is the truth. It is what it is. We cannot, we cannot bend it to please people. And so being offensive 
it is something that the Christian life is going to naturally be in the face of people. When we speak about the gates of Hades, the first place that actually takes me to when we say that the gates of hell should not prevail, um, I'm reminded that Jesus mm -hmm. was resurrected, yeah. that, the, that, that hell itself could not keep him back. True. And so when he says that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, I think the church this day and age has the great privilege yeah. of getting a hold of the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing that that is a great part of who we yes. are, that he is risen, that no matter what the attack of the enemy, he is not going to be able to keep us captive or hold us down. Amen. Uh, and, you know, that is absolutely essential to the church having this conviction that there is a power in us. And I think the last thing is what we see evident even in the early church and, and in church history. The time of, the, of greatest growth in the church in terms of number were the times of greatest persecution. persecution yes, right? So, uh, yes, they were offensive to their society. And did bad things happen to good believers? Yes, it, yes, did. it did. Did the church grow? Yes, yes it, it did. did. Awesome. Um, you know, and, and so those may be some of the things for us to consider in, in the sense that being offensive is part of the Christian journey. But it's what we're called to. No, that, that I agree with. And my final question goes around being in all of these various campuses, Siloam yeah. and the name that we carry. How do you see us as Siloam becoming a lot more victorious in the things of God? And if you say it, mm -hmm. then after that, I'm going to ask you to pray it <laughs> over the people. Yeah, being victorious... You know, and, and when we talk about our asylum campuses, we're talking about the church yes. and, and the local church. Multiple campuses, but the local church. And for me, it always goes back to Ephesians 4 is the model of the local church. Yes. And what does that require? That we grow. Yeah. That we grow in maturity of the faith and that we become practical in how we serve in the body of Christ. Awesome. And I think when the local church has believers who are maturing in the faith, and who are practically serving in the body, you know, um, we're on our way to victory. Come on. I, I, I truly believe that the local church is the means by which God fulfills his purpose for the earth yes. this day and age. He is the chief shepherd of the okay. church. You know, we can have many good work kind of bodies around us, but it is the local church that is the body of Christ. And so for him to get his work done in the earth, both inside the walls and outside the walls of the church, it is the believer who is in the church that must grow in maturity, yeah. and the believer must grow in such a way that they can practically serve. Do something. Do something in the church. You may be a preacher, well, preach. You may be somebody who can intercede, then intercede. You may be somebody who has a beautiful smile, then greet somebody Speaking at the door. Somebody, but the door. do yep. something in the church. Awesome. You have Let's to pray, pray on that. <laughs> so, Father, we bow in your presence today. Yes. And, and we're so grateful that you give us the privilege of being in your body the Thank church of the Lord that. Jesus Christ. And to each one, O Lord Almighty, who you have placed in the body of Christ, you have granted us grace, your word declares. You have granted us gifting. Thank and you, you call for us to walk in maturity <laughs> and to be individuals who will serve. And I pray today, O Lord, of asylum. I pray, Lord, that even in this season, a keys to the kingdom. Yes. Open up the eyes of our understanding and help us get a hold of the keys, O Lord, that you have set before us. And Lord, let there be maturity and let there be service, O Lord, in, in and through the Jesus. church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for believers, O Lord, who would get a hold of the Holy Scriptures yes. and grow and walk in maturity in their relationship with you. And as we come together, we ask that you would bless us, Lord, that you would bless Siloam. I pray that there would be a multiplication, O Father, in this body, a multiplication Lord. of believers, O Father, who walk victorious mm. because the foundation of our lives is that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So bless us with this, we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. Siloam and Kingdom friends, Keys to the Kingdom podcast. Thank you, Pastor Reynolds. Thank you for being a blessing today. Thank you, And sir. encouraging God's people. 
24 to 27 October, that's our conference date across all of our campuses. You need to be a part of it. Invite somebody, tell somebody about it, and we will receive the keys to do great things for the Lord. Amen. Amen.